you know, get about 80% of the way there and take action. Um, no matter what it is, whether it's, you know, flipping land or wholesaling or getting involved in real estate in any capacity or making your own business. So I think that's, that's the main thing I want to leave people with is get 80% of the way there and take action. Hey guys, Dan Habercost, uh, Front Range Land, Mason McDonald, RM Golden, and we're back today, just the two of us. And today I'm going to be interviewing Mason. And for those of you who don't know, Mason was a hospital CEO managing a nine-figure P&L before getting into land. And that's quite the transition. And, and many of our listeners, many people we run into all the time are in that process or working towards transitioning from a, a traditional W-2 to uh, running their own business like we are and like Mason is. And so today we're going to talk through that process. So Mason, welcome. Dan, it's great to be here. Uh, it's fun to be in the hot seat uh, with you interviewing me today. Yeah, looking forward to it, man. And hopefully we can pull something out of this that I don't already know. Um, so let's just start at the beginning, man. Give them a background. What was your role like before you got into land? Oh, yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll go back even further than that. So um, I I grew up in Texas and, uh, you know, my first career choice was to be the shortstop for the Yankees. Um, <laughs> no, nah, I'm just kidding. We won't go back that far. But uh, so I, I grew up in a family where I kind of had the rich dad and the poor dad. Um, you know, I had my dad who wasn't uh, overly involved um, but he was a commercial real estate investor. He inherited a commercial real estate portfolio when he was pretty young. And I never really saw him work hard, but I saw him have a lot of money. You know, we grew up with planes and boats and multiple homes. Um, and then my mom and my stepdad, and we were always financially comfortable, uh, but it was absolutely, and, and my dad never finished college or anything like that. It was absolutely on my mom's side who I, who raised me with my stepdad. Um, it was education, education, education. Uh, for, for those of you guys that have Jewish mothers, uh, I had two choices. I could be either a physician or I could be an attorney. And so that's what I was going to do. Um, you know, I grew up in an interesting household with divorced parents and a, a brother um, who has mental illness. So um, I, I got into college and I wanted to be a physician. I wanted to be a psychiatrist specifically. So I think um, starting out my approach with that, uh, it forced me to always have a sense of delayed gratification where... Um, in order to become a physician, you have to do four years of undergrad, four years of medical school, and anywhere from three to 10 years of residency and fellowship. So I didn't think I was going to get a paycheck until I was like 35 years old. Um, all that to say, uh, I was the entrepreneurial kid. I'm the type A personality. When I was in college, you know, I, I helped bring back a fraternity that was off campus and was involved in organizations and working and interning. And, uh, Similar to a transition that, um, you know, I did more recently from healthcare to land, uh, I was tired, I was exhausted, and I hated the direction of my life. So my senior year of college, um, I was a neuroscience undergrad, uh, I was interning at the VA, and I could not go to med school. I took the MCAT, I did fine on it, uh, had the opportunity to interview, um, didn't do it, kind of had that senior life crisis, I guess. And I... Um, was talking to my research supervisor and said, I don't know what to do. I don't want to go get my MD. I don't want to get my PhD. What do I do with my life? And he said, what about healthcare administration? Um, you've got that entrepreneurial spirit. It's the business side of healthcare. I didn't even know healthcare administration existed. So five days before I graduated undergrad, I got accepted into graduate school to go get my master's in healthcare administration, which was uh, very scary. Uh, my girlfriend, who uh, is now my wife, um, was very supportive the entire time. But I thought I might be waiting tables after college. I don't know what to do with a neuroscience degree. There's not much you could do. So um, jumped into it, was more excited about healthcare administration than I had been about um, going to medical school. Uh, grad school was a little bit different, um, where it was very business focused, very practical application focused. Um, but God, did I still hate school. Um, but I was ambitious. I remember getting a personality test back. Uh, and my number one uh, personality trait on the Strengths Finder 2.0 was I was futuristic. And that's always the way I thought. Where when I was younger, I dreamed of being a physician, making a lot of money, uh, or, you know, being the short staff for the Yankees. I was always thinking about the future. And so I thought, you know, what's the next step for me? And being a type A individual, I said, I want to be the CEO of a hospital before I turn 30 years old. And 
you know, for anyone that was listening uh, that might have went to grad school with me, um, you know, I said it all the time. I think the professors thought I was funny um, and all that to say uh, I did do it. Whenever I got out of grad school, I started a residency. Um, and I think this is all kind of important to, you know, the land. And I'm not just saying it to give my own biography or anything like that. It's all of these components that allowed me to be very successful in this business. And after grad school, I did a residency. It was 12 months long. I rotated through different departments in the hospital. I learned every single aspect of the business from uh, working as a tech on the unit, uh, you know, to housekeeping and cleaning toilets to making food in the kitchen to building out pro formas on a 32 million dollar 80 bed hospital expansion um, and going through the construction process and design process of that whenever i was you know 23 years old um, i learned it all that year um, went into an associate administrator role the very next year where i had seven uh, direct reports 80 employees and was managing um, you know, seven departments within within that had a lot of success doing that. Um, added a lot of value by being very very focused on process improvement, and I think that's something that we can spend some time later talking about. Where what I did is, if there was a process uh, that wasn't documented, I would document the process. And I think so often in the company and in healthcare in general, stuff can get so messy. Where I would hear it from leadership all the time that. You know, that employee should have known better. And I would ask the question of, hey, did, you know, was there a documented process and procedure associated with it? And most of the time was no. And then I said, well, you can't hold that employee accountable um, to anything that goes wrong if there's not a documented standard operating procedure for anything that you're doing in the business. So all that to say, I had success there. Um, I became chief. I got promoted and moved out to Colorado in February of 2020 and became chief operating officer of a hospital out here. So I'm, uh, shoot, 24, 25 years old now. Um, and then COVID hit. And that's kind of whenever, you know, the balls really started rolling of like, this is not fun. I am not having a good time doing this. I'm working all the time. I was managing almost every department except finance and physicians in the hospital. I was overworked. I was underpaid. I was tired. And this whole time that I've been talking about since graduate school, I'd been listening to Bigger Pockets. I'd been listening to uh, all all of the real estate podcasts that are out there, um, and reading every single book that I could possibly read. So I was always doing it. I was saving up money to start investing. I was ready, um, and I started my business in 2020, summer of 2020, uh, is when I started my LLC. Uh, that being said, I did absolutely nothing with it um, for well over a year. Um, I got promoted into the CEO position when I was 26 years old. Uh, and, uh, you know, we had just about a nine figure PL depending on the year, uh, which that's a profit and loss statement. So I was 26 years old managing about a hundred million dollars, um, which is kind of crazy, terrifying. And I had definitely had a lot of imposter syndrome, but you hear that, you hear that age, you hear that title, you, um, you know, have a decent compensation and everything like that, but none of it mattered. None of it was gratifying to me. I was hypertensive stage two. I was depressed. I was tired. I was sleeping two hours a night. Um, I was sad all the time. You know, my relationship with my wife wasn't as good as it could have been. Um, and I just had no energy. And finally, stuff started to change whenever I was the CEO. And what happened was uh, I was ready to invest. Um, I had saved up $60,000. I was very proud of that because I, I still have over six figures of student loans um, You know, throughout college. I mean, I was donating plasma to afford to be able to eat when I was in graduate school. I'd saved up money, had this title, had this position, ready to invest in real estate. Felt like I was taking action. And the gentleman that I met with, um, both of our good friends, Brent Bowers, uh, I was going to invest in a townhome develop with, <laughs> development with him. And... Uh, I think he was going to give me 8% interest and I'd get my money back in like three years or something. And while we were grabbing lunch, we were, we were eating Mexican food and uh, I ordered a salad to like look like I was like this competent professional that ate salad. And I, I remember it so vividly because it was that life changing moment that I think so many of us have. Um, and I to asked him what he did, you know, to make money. And he said he flipped land. And it was just like that experience whenever I was in undergrad, whenever my research supervisor told me about healthcare administration, where I was like, what is land flipping? Why does that exist? And anyways, Brent, Brent sold me on his course. I took that course. And that year, 
uh, is whenever I got my first deal. Um, November of 2021, I purchased seven and a half acres in Pagosa Springs, Colorado for $40,000. And whenever I was on vacation the next day, uh, it was my 27th birthday that I closed on that land. Um, I realized the value of the land uh, and quit my job when I got back and uh, eventually sold that land for $185,000. And here I am. So there, there is the uh, abridged version that probably was too long of my background from when I was a kid wanting to be the shortstop to the uh, New York or for the North New York Yankees to where um, I made that transition from CEO to land flipper. Wow. Okay. Thank you for that, Mason. There was a lot, a lot to unpack there, but it, it sounds like uh, you owe your success to Brent, which is, which is fun to kind of hear that, uh, he taught you a lot of what you know, too. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So we, we, we love you, Brent. Um, I owe my whole life to you. You are my greatest, uh, savior and friend, but no, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah. Brent, Brent taught me the ropes. Yep. Yep. Well, okay. Let's try and dive into some of the important points there. You know, going from running a hospital to starting a land business, really, really different. And one of the biggest things that come to mind immediately is that you were stepping into what you said, a, a nine-figure P&L, and you had to add systems and processes, but that's already a, syst a, a big system, a machine that's running. And you have employees and people under you, and, and you can delegate and direct things. So how was the transition to starting your own small business where you had to go from CEO to also every other role and you didn't have people to delegate to and you had no systems and no SOPs. What was it? Tell me about that. Oh man, did it put me in my place? Uh, no, there, there's nothing better than um, having your perspective changed and kind of getting pantsed by reality where I, you're, you're right. I had uh, hundreds of employees working for me and I did so much in the business. You know, uh, what's interesting about my company that I worked for is fortune 200 company and you're right, it was an established system. That hospital, uh, it's 2023. Uh, September of 2023 is its 100th year anniversary. Wow. So it's been around for a while. And um, jumping into and starting my own business, you know, I always kind of thought that, man, I'm going to get in there and I'm going to kick ass and take names. And I'm the best and smartest person that's ever existed. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of got started. And, um, you know, to talk, talk about my failures of getting started, um, healthcare and in the United States is probably the most overregulated industry that possibly exists, um, you know, at least in the country, if not in the world, super overregulated. There's more regulatory agencies than I could name uh, and so many checkboxes and approval layers. And so jumping into this business where I had unlimited freedom, unlimited options to do whatever I wanted was so exciting to me. But the problem is I went from an executive to an employee again. And even though I was an employee as an executive, I was like, man, I need to develop standard operating procedures. And I, I have a Lean Six Sigma black belt for those of you guys that know manufacturing or healthcare, which is entirely around process improvement and reduction of variation and elimination of waste. So I'm very lean oriented, but you need processes in order to figure out what you're doing. And I was like, man, someone, someone needs to make some processes for my business. I'm looking around <laughs> I'm like sitting at that point in time, my desk is like this you know, three foot by two foot desk in my living room. Cause you know, I hadn't, you know, done anything yet. And I'm looking around, I'm like, man, someone should do this. And I looked around for like a week for someone to do these standard operating procedures. And people are listening. I'm like, what is wrong with it with this guy? And, uh, it, I, I didn't remember how to be an employee and I had to go out and do stuff. And so I, I think that was one of the biggest transitions for me of like, okay, well, I dude, if you're going to build a business, you got to build this business yourself. So I think that was one of the things of, I had to look in the mirror and recognize of if anything is missing in the business, I have to do it myself or I have to hire someone to do it myself. And I think the second most painful transition for me was, like I said, it was the most, healthcare was one of the most overregulated industries that exists. And I went from a red tape, no industry where I was told no constantly of ideas and innovations and opportunities for improvement, whether it was from corporate bureaucracy or just regulatory environment. And then I went into where I could kind of do whatever, you know, being an investor, like you're, you're held to, you know, the laws of the country and the laws of the state, but there's not over very much regulation going on involved or getting involved. And, um, 
I got really creative really quickly and had very little success, uh, where I, you know, I, I, I made, you know, whatever it was, 114, 115,000 on my first flip, which, you know, kind of kept me afloat and made me happy. But four months after that, I didn't get a single deal under contract. Yep. And it's because I tried to get too creative too quickly. Yeah. Wow. You know, that's, that would be challenging. You know, I had directed people myself before moving into my own business, but not at the level you're talking about. And, and to go from just being the orchestrator to having to do everything yourself is not easy. But let's dive into an excellent transition there. You hit on what I was going to say. You do your first deal, you make 115 grand. And, and just for a point of reference, what were you making your last year as hospital CEO? Uh, like 160 grand base with bonus potential up to and over double that. So not as much as people think, you know, for a hospital CEO. Sure. Okay. So you had a solid income, but then there in one deal, mm -hmm. you make, you know, one half to one third of that, depending on what, what your bonus looked like. Um, so you got too creative. What, what do you mean? Can we dive into that a little bit? What were you doing wrong? Oh man, I listened to every podcast that ever existed about everything. Yeah. And so I can name marketing strategies for the next 45 minutes. And the way I started this business was by sending blind offers. You know, I want to buy your land at 123 Main Street for X number of dollars. And so I'd send out blind offer campaigns. And, you know, at that point in time to get that deal, I, I sent out maybe 1,300 total letters, um, which is pretty great when you think about how much that cost and that return. Uh, so what I did, instead of sending more blind offers that had proven a concept that I could spend $1,000 on letters and make $115,000, um, if you can calculate that return, it's um, a lot. Uh, I did texting. Um, I did email. I did direct to voicemail, mm. um, which is not quite cold calling. Um, I uh, What else did I do? Um, I did cold calling. Um, and... Uh, yeah. And then I kind of just like sat back and waited. And it's so funny to look back and think where my business is now, where, um, you know, Dan, you and I are so lead measure focused sure. and I was not focused on anything. And I am one of the most goal oriented people that you could possibly meet. And I've got my life, you know, planned out for the next hundred years. Uh, you know, should I get to live for the next hundred years? Um, but I, I was just sitting back waiting for leads to come in. I didn't have a website. I didn't, I didn't even have like a domain or an email associated with it. I would just like randomly send out batch text messages and stuff. And the answer that I got most often was like, F off, never text me again. Um, and then I would sit back and wait and think a lot. And that would be my action item for the week is like, hey, think about marketing strategies. <laughs> and that's not an action item or anything like that. But I got really creative. and I just kind of sat around and waited for something to happen. Um, so you combine that of like being an employee and self-employed for the first time with uh, overly creative and marketing strategies that I hadn't proven or built out the systems for. And it didn't work. Uh, didn't get a deal for four months. But, you know, that allowed me to kind of look in the mirror eventually and change my perspective. Sure, sure. That's a problem so many of us have run into and done where you get excited about too many things at once and then fail at all of them. So it sounds like you had a fractured inconsistent marketing campaign that was using a variety of mediums and was not doing any of them consistently that you're you're absolutely right and i didn't really care to have any metrics in the business you know i had i had my you know deals per you know per letter mm -hmm. uh and i wasn't using anything with it and i think i think looking back on it um i i consider myself an expert in process improvement but i consider myself not an expert in creation of processes and standard operating procedures. I can look at a process and I can, you know, utilize whatever form, you know, uh, process improvement methodology, like DMAIC is something we use a lot. It's define, measure, analyze, improve, control um, is a really effective way to go in and fix a process and sustain it in a way that will forever change it and make it more efficient and more effective. But I just had no processes. Like I, my standard operating procedures were absolutely minimal, nothing at all. Um, and so it, it allowed me failing like that and feeling like an idiot where I kept, you know, justifying and defending myself of like, well, I made more on one land flip than most people will ever make flipping land. You know, cause I was in the groups and hearing what people were doing and I'm like, man, you guys don't know what you're doing. <laughs> and so I think, I think finally having an ego check of not getting a few, any deals for a few months allowed me to, you know, stop and think and reiterate. Uh, or, you know, change what I was doing back to what worked. So I sent another thousand letters in May of 2023 
or sorry, May of 2022. Um, and I got five more deals from those. So, Great. and and it just made sense. No, yeah, that's, you know, some lessons have to be learned the hard way. We all need to have our ego checked from time to time. I can relate. But, okay, tell me about going from hospital CEO to the land business. You had to do things, number one, that you hadn't done before, but number two, that are out of your you know, what you're good at. You had to wear every hat and you're not good at everything. Nobody is. And I think that's inevitable when starting a new business. You know, I had someone tell me recently, I'm organized. I am not organized. I'm the stereotypical person that's good at sales and public speaking. But uh, if I had to do my own accounting, I'd, I'd blow my brains out. And it's just, I wanted to start a successful business. And so I, I put together systems because I had to, right? So Talk to us a little bit about when you're getting started, you know, how did you adapt and force yourself to wear every hat effectively, even if some of them were not necessarily what you're good at, nor what you wanted to do? Yeah, I, uh, first off, Dan, you are organized, dude. I mean, you, you, uh, you have so everyone listening, he's, he's a liar. He's extremely organized in what he does. And it's, he's, uh, it's painful for him, but he's good at it. And I, I want to hit on that because it's the same thing for me in business where Dan and I have very similar personalities where, you know, if we're, we're both the CEO type, we're not the operator, we can do it and we can be very good and very effective at it, but it's very painful mm -hmm. at it. So what I'm good at is I'm good at get, getting people to believe in a vision yeah. um, that is greater than themselves and get really motivated to go do it. Um, but I think, um, you know, kind of looking back at that transition and recognizing that, you know, there's so many people that get into business where th this is what's dangerous for the people that feel like for the control freaks out there. Um, and I am not a control freak. I'm the opposite of a control freak, actually, where what what I struggled with is I was so adamant my entire career about hiring effectively and hiring people better than you and delegating absolutely everything that you possibly can to give it to the best possible people because you are not going to um there, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that you shouldn't really focus on your weaknesses you should focus on your strengths and get really good at your strengths so it was kind of painful to have that like dichotomy of thought where I was going against what I had preached for so many years in my business um, or, or in my, in my W2 job, whenever I was an executive. So, uh, but what, with that being said, if you're creating a business, unless you have the money to have someone come in and create a turnkey business for you, you have to be the person that creates the actual outline of the entire business. Um, and and that right there and kind of having that realization that, you know, it's like, dude, dude, you're in charge of this business. This is your livelihood. This is what has allowed you to leave your job. Um, this is what's going to create generational wealth for your family. And you're not treating it like a business. I felt too emotional. I was too involved in everything. Um, and finally being able to put it on paper of actually what this business is, you know, creating the mission, the vision, the values, um, all the stuff that I learned in grad school. Um, and creating all the standard operating procedures. I mean, flipping land is the easiest business in the world. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. All we do is we direct seller market uh, and we buy land for cheap and sell it for more. And the fact that I had no processes or procedures associated with that, um, you know, was very confusing. And so I think finally spending the time, you know, you, if, if you've read Traction, you know, working in the business versus working on the business. I spent a lot of time working on the business to allow myself to effectively work in the business as versus only working on in the business without any process map or, or guides associated with it. So it was kind of taking my executive hat off and putting my founder's hat on and building it out to where I could get back into where I was in a comfortable position, which was wearing that executive hat. Yeah, no, I, you hit on everything I was hoping you would. And, and you made a good point there at the beginning. Yes, I, I have become organized, not because I want to, not because it's my natural skill set, but because I want to to have a successful business. And so that was just something I had to deal with up front. And so I made it happen. And so anyways, you said what I was looking for there. Uh, but Perfect. no, that's that's great, Mason. So you transition from being a CEO, you're running your land business. You know, there's a few more things I want to hit on. But wh where are you at today? 
Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I guess it's June of 2023. Um, you know, my first deal I purchased November 21st of 2021. Uh, so I'm right about at a year and a half into this, uh, from a full-time basis starting in January of 2022. Um, this year we're expected, uh, on a net from a net income perspective, uh, to make seven figures. Uh, I have a full-time acquisition manager working under me. He is uh, salary plus commission, um, and he's got 20 plus years experience in real estate. He's way better at it than I am. So kind of back to what I was saying before of, you know, my instinct is to uh, lead and manage and effectively delegate. You know, that's where we're at. Uh, we have, you know, built out standard operating procedures. I have process videos of every aspect of the business. Um, the land business, um, my goal, you know, and you and I set some very similar goals to to each other at the beginning of this year. And I'm on the path that by the end of this year, I hope that I have fully automated and removed myself from the land business, uh, not from the aspect of I don't want to be involved and want to be doing things, but I don't need to be there anymore. And that's the sign of a successful leader is not having to actually be there every day. Um, to allow your team and your processes and your systems do it. So the land business is flourishing. I mean, I'm coaching, I'm consulting, working on building lending businesses. Um, I'm having more fun than ever. I feel like I'm in a startup environment and I feel like I'm actually allowed to uh, do what I'm best at, which is be um, an effective leader. That's awesome. For a year and a half, that's uh, that's a lot of progress made there, a lot of lessons learned. Um, looking back, is there anything that stands out that you wish you had done differently or somewhere where you really failed beyond what we already talked about as far as the fractured marketing? Any other thoughts on what you would have done differently? Yeah, I, I, I think I hit on a majority of the points um, of, you know, to kind of reiterate of like building out the processes and procedures, all the boring stuff, do that first. It'll make it so much easier down the road and then stick to what works. Um, I think uh, recognizing that I could have, you know, kind of done both at the same time for a lot longer because I, I got started learning about land flipping, you know, f five months before I actually got my first deal um, and recognizing how simple and easy it was. But I think sometimes we have to take that leap of faith. And, you know, I did not have the mental, emo emotional or even physical energy to do this business. So, um, you know, I think I think looking back, obviously, I wish I had started earlier uh, I wish I had invested in Bitcoin, you know, seven years ago yeah. and, you know, all that kind of fun stuff. But no, I, I, I think the main thing is like, do the boring stuff first and get really good at the boring stuff. And then because if you can do that, then it allows you the creativity to do it if your business is running itself, which is where I'm at now, where I can get really creative with my business and start testing stuff and actually getting to see, hey, am I smarter than the experts that taught me this um, or is or is this the best it can get? And I know it's not the best it can get. So I'm having a lot more fun doing that now. Good, good. So you had mentioned how you were barely sleeping, you were stressed, hypertensive. So, you know, what do your stress levels look like now and your income? You know, how is running this business relative to running the hospital for from both an income and, and just well being perspective, quality of life? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it doesn't feel like it because we keep, you know, so much money in the business. But yeah, I I expect to net seven figures this year, which is incredible. It's way more than I was making as a CEO. Um, and the actual business that's making me that much money, I'm working way, 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 way less of, you know, I don't really work after three. Um, you know, I don't work on the weekends. I don't get calls anymore. Um, you know, I'm I'm working a little bit more now than I have been, but it's on stuff that I've been wanting to do kind of my entire life, like coaching, consulting, content creation, um, uh, you know, building new businesses constantly. Like this is more fun than ever. And I don't even feel like it's work. Um, I'm a little socially drained at the end of the day um, after, you know, having so many conversations with so many high level people that, you know, make me feel, feel dumb. Uh, but yeah, from a stress level, I'm, I'm healthier than I've been in a long time. Uh, I'm sleeping, you know, seven to nine hours every single night. Uh, I'm getting to work out consistently every day. Um, you know, having an accountability partner, uh, you know, in you, Dan, is I think one thing that's, you know, allowed my business to floor, you know, flourish at a level that I hadn't seen before. Because, you know, whenever you're in an executive position, especially in a public company where you can't disseminate information, uh, to other people. And there's so few people that know what you're going through. 
Um, I didn't have any 20 something year old CEOs to talk to about my business and how to figure it out. Uh, you know, I had older individuals and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but having someone a similar age, uh, to work with you, to challenge you and to make you better physically, mentally, emotionally, um, I think is huge. And so, yeah, I'm happier, healthier and making more money than ever. That's awesome. Yeah, no, that you made a good point there. It is, uh, always more fun to do something with other people who are in a similar place as you and to push each other to be better, better. Uh, so I, I can definitely relate to that. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say, knowing that many people listening to this are probably in process of doing the same thing, transitioning from traditional employment to running their own business? Yeah, I think, uh, don't quit your job before you make your first sale, uh, which is exactly what I did. Um, but it, it was time for me. I think it's, you, you know, we say it all the time of, uh, like with this podcast, for instance, it's, you know, we're, we're recording from webcams from our houses. We're getting content out there. Um, we're very transparent about the process of everything we're doing. We're 80% of the way there and we're taking action. And that right there is, I think one of the most important things, because if you're the analytical and engineering type, you're never going to get anywhere because you're going to spend 12 years building out your standard operating procedures and making sure that you can, you know, uh, do a regression analysis to ensure the most effective, you know, form of marketing is statistically significant. And, um, you know, if you're the action taker, uh, that is just focused on action, you got 20% of the way there and you took action and then you're, you're not going to be able to make any success at all. So it's, you know, get about 80% of the way there and take action. Um, no matter what it is, whether it's, you know, flipping land or wholesaling or getting involved in real estate in any capacity or making your own business. So I think that's that's the main thing I want to leave people with is get 80% of the way there and take action. And then the second thing is go out on a drive and look around. And the reason I say that is you are going to drive past strip center after strip center of all of these businesses that are profitable and are probably not run by as sophisticated of a person as you are. And if they can do it, why not you? Yeah, I think that's a good mic drop moment. So we'll uh, we'll leave it at that, my friend. But uh, thank you for your time. It was fun interviewing you. Good to know a little bit more on your background. And guys, you heard him. Figure out 80% of it and take action. Heck yeah, Dan. We'll pick it up Until again. Until next time.